let's talk a little bit about image display. Um, uh, yeah. I am not going to get into all the nitty gritty of your display monitors because all this will change within the next two months or something. But um, most of what we're doing now is the LCD stuff. Um, uh, the the older ones, the cathode rays, of course, were heavier. If you look back and try to pick up that TV back there versus picking up a flat screen TV, they're they're heavy. Um, so sometimes back in the day, we had to transfer CT images to film, and there was a camera capture process that had to be used by that. This is the only instance in which we would talk about a camera related to CT images is within trying to translate CT images to film. Do not ever refer to the tube as a camera, right? It is not a camera. Um, okay. Uh, and the film that we use in CT is single emulsion, but I have, I have not seen a functioning CT film system in close to 10 years. I, I, I have not, any of the clinical sites I go to, no one is requesting film. This is worth some attention though, and it'll probably be, the bulk of our time will be a discussion of different window settings. So here we have the exact same image, right? The exact same image. All that's been changed is the window width and level. One of them, the one on the left, is what we would call a lung window, right? And the one on the right might be like a soft tissue or abdomen window. You can see that it makes a significant difference on the amount of detail apparent. One thing that I always, always kind of jumps out at me in a lung window is just all of the various structures within the lung, right? The branchings of pulmonary arteries and the bronchioles, things like that. Versus a soft tissue window, I cannot see any of those lung markings, but what I can see more clearly now is the heart, right? I can see coronary arteries, I can see greater vessels, um, I can even see more bony detail on the spine just because of the way that the image is being displayed. So that is, this is where we're going to spend most of our time is in understanding these different settings and understanding how to make adjustments to them. Now, unfortunately, I don't think PAX is working on my computer. Um, I'm going to try to figure out a way to get like a simulated PAX kind of set up either online or on a computer to where you can manipulate these values and see how it influences images because it is a, an important skill to cultivate. Um, you probably had the opportunity as x-ray tech folks and I think radiation therapy to manipulate window width and levels on x-ray images and on um, some of the therapy machines and things like that. You, this, so this will apply to that um, as well. Uh, most studies require at least two different window settings, right? So we'll go ahead and do reconstructions of like a series of lung windows and then a series of abdomen windows for just about everything that we do. A brain, we do a series of like skull windows for the bony detail of the skull, then we'll do a series for the white matter of the brain. Um, and ideal window settings are kind of subjective. It, it depends on the, the viewer and also maybe the monitor that they're using. Um, and typically the image departments will have some preset window width and levels that they use that are kind of like automatically generated by the CT scanner. Those will be kind of agreed, agreed upon values and you can manipulate from there. Also, this, most CT scanners have some kind of preset function in them. So uh, on the function keys at the top of the keyboard, you can push a, fun a function key and very quickly change the window width and level. Um, to this point, even though very few of us will probably ever be printing CT images, if you want to, pre to print a CT image, you have to adjust the window width and level prior to printing. If you print a lung series, but you forget to adjust it to the lung window width and level setting, it will print a lung series with a soft tissue window on it. It'll be totally useless. Um, okay. Interestingly enough, um, not only does the human eye, the human eye can only maybe actually perceive about 40 different shades of gray, the computer can only, most monitors can only represent about 250 
six or so shades of gray, right? So again, there's that power of two, 256. I think that's like, what, two to the, I can't remember what. Um, but these, so there's over 2,000 different Hounsfield unit values. So there's more Hounsfield readings than there are shades of gray that the computer monitor can represent. And there are more shades of gray that the computer monitor can represent than the human eye can see. This is essentially why we do these different window widths and levels, is the limitations of our monitors and the limitations of the human eye. Um, so as a general rule, the human eye cannot appreciate contrast differences of less than 10%, whereas CT scanners can easily demonstrate differences of less than 1%. Okay? So the computer has a higher ability or more sensitivity to different levels of gray. So let's talk about the gray scale. This is what we generally use to display CT images. Occasionally, if we're doing 3D CT studies, we may choose a different scale um, to, to use to view different structures. Um, but the system assigns a certain number of Hounsfield units to each shade of gray. Okay? And generally, it functions exactly like an x-ray in that bone is going to be white so those are positive colors <coughs> air and things are going to be black so those are negative colors on the Hounsfield scale okay um, so the higher attenuation value is going to be light lower attenuation attenuation value is going to be black window width this is going to determine the number of Hounsfield units illustrated on a specific image, okay? Um, any value that's higher than the width of the window is going to be white, just completely whited out. So on the lung windows that we were looking at earlier, the higher values like the heart or the, the spine were just completely whited out, right? Um, anything that's lower than the selected range will be completely black. So on the soft tissue window levels that we were looking at earlier, the lungs were significantly less than the, the width of the window, so they were just completely blacked out. Um, and increasing the window width assigns more Hounsfield units to each shade of gray. So bear in mind, again, we've only got 256 that the computer can display and only 40 that my eye can actually see. So a lot of window widths are going to be in that range of like 40 or a little bit more than 40 sometimes. But we're not going to go a lot more than that unless we have specific reasons. Okay? Um, okay. So here again is a representation of the grayscale and as it relates to window width. Um, so let's assume that we just have 10 shades of gray available um, and 300 is selected as the window width. The 300 density values that are apparent in that image um, will each be given, they'll be divided by 10, and they'll, we'll wind up with 10 shades of gray. Everything else will be completely white or completely black. Does everyone understand? Is this making sense so far? Okay. Okay. If the window width is set at 300, um, determining which 300 Hounsfield units um, will be displayed from all the 2,000 that are possible. This, um, this will be the window level. So we're going to select a certain number of Hounsfield units to display within the window. And generally the number that's given for the window level is the center of the window level. Okay? What do I mean by that? Let's imagine we have this Hound... Whoa! Sorry. Let's imagine we have this Hounsfield scale right here with zero for water. All right? We will set, let's say, a window width of 30 for purposes here. This is um, positive 1,000 and negative 1,000. Right? There's absolutely no reason for me to set a window level of negative 1,000. Right? 
because my width is 30. So if I, if I wanted to set a window width that included all of the negative values, I would set it at um, negative 1,000 plus 30, right? Which is going to give me like negative 970, right? Um, now you could even subtract it by 15. The additional values probably wouldn't be very helpful. But it's going, to, it's going to center it here. So now I have a width of 30, right? But the level here is like negative 970. Okay. So again, it's the center value for the window width. And we might also call it window center. Some people do. I just call them widths and levels. Um, and it's going to determine which level of shades of gray to display. So here again is that illustration where we've set a window level of zero, but then the width is given as um, 300, right? So that means a range from negative 150 to positive 150. Here's a question. The selected window width is 400. The selected level is 50. Which Hounsfield units are displayed on the image as shades of gray? Which of these selections will be displayed on the image? <coughs> negative 200 to 200. <coughs> negative 150 to 450. Negative 150 to 250. Or 350 to 450. It's actually this one, negative 150 to 250. The centering point is at um, 50. And we will make a measurement from 50. And it, it's, so the, the total size, right, is 400. But it means it ranges 200 in this direction and 200 in this direction. Does that make sense? You might want to add another. Oh, right. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, that would have confused folks. You tracking with me now? Okay. Yeah. I, I can't. I'm sorry. Okay. As a general rule for setting the window level, um, we need it to be set to roughly the same value as the average attenuation value for the tissue of interest. So it's helpful to know different attenuation values, or at least be able to ballpark them. Um, lung is going to be the one thing that's in a negative range, right? Um, most other soft tissue um, structures are going to be in a positive range around the level of 100. Or less? What's negative range is the long end? It'd be like negative 700 or something like that. I'm just kind of conjecturing. Um, liver, I know for sure, is 60. And it's normally plus or minus 10, depending on the patient's body habitus and scanning factors. Bone is going to be much higher than that. Contrast is somewhere between the level of the soft tissue and the bone. So like maybe 400. So in terms of setting the window width, um, as a general rule, um, we're going to apply widths of like 500 to 2,000. So if you have to guess at a window width, you can apply something in those general ranges. Um, and the goal is to see all of the various tissues in one image, right? Um, a wider window width is going to show more anatomic diversity. So for example, a lung window really just shows the lung, it does not very clearly show the bone or the media, mediastinum. Um, 
and that's because some of it is lost just to the window. So, but the the problem of the wider width is that we lose some of the subtle detail and the ability to discriminate between little tiny different attenuation values among the different structures. Um, as wider wider window width settings are decreased, the image um, they're going to with the wider window width settings, we'll see a decrease in image contrast, and so they will also suppress noise. So if we have a slightly noisy image, it may be helpful to increase the window width. It will diminish some of that noise at the, um, at the cost of contrast. Okay. So here is a review question. A window width is of 90 is most likely to be used to display an image of the, and it's asking for different anatomy. We mentioned that lung, right, was going to be in what window level? I mean, it'd be negative, so we know it's not lung. Femur is going to be in what window width level? It can be really high, right? Because it's a bone. So we know it's not that. Um, so now we have a choice between the brain and the abdomen. I mentioned to you that the abdomen, a, li a predominant uh, or a dominant structure in the abdomen is the liver. I know it has a Hounsfield unit of 60. Um, and I said it can be greater or less than 10, right? So is that in the range of the liver? No, it's not in the range of the liver. So the answer is the brain. The brain is more dense than most of the stuff in the abdomen. That's what it sounds like. Okay. All right. Here's a, here's a very important thing, and we've talked a little bit about this, I think, with the discussion of bolus tracking and things like that. An ROI is just a region of interest. It's often circular, but we can also make it like oval-shaped or elliptic, square, rectangular. We can make them in different sizes and shapes, and they are custom drawn by you, the CT tech. Okay, um, so it is up to you to define where you place them, all those kinds of things. Um, when we're placing an ROI, it, most of the ROIs that we place are circular-shaped, like that. Okay. Because, again, a lot of the structures that we're looking at are roughly circular shaped. We, people don't have a lot of, like, boxes inside of them. None of our organs look real boxy. Um, let's say that we're going to place an ROI inside the aorta, right? We want to make sure that it is um, very close to, it's within the aorta and close to the size of the aorta to, pr to appropriately um, sample what's going on in the aorta. So I might need to make this ROI a little bit bigger, right, to account for the size of the structure so that I'm accurately representing all the information that's inside of here because eventually it's going to kick out a Hounsfield unit reading. And if this aorta doesn't have contrast in it, that reading is going to be close to water, so it's going to be like 10. But if it does have contrast in it, it will be much higher, right? So you can have upwards of 300 for a Hounsfield unit reading inside the aorta if it has contrast in it, okay? One thing to talk about, though, when we're talking about ROIs is I would not want to place an ROI like this where it is half in, half out of the aorta. It's completely useless information because it's sampling the attenuation values between two different structures, and it's going to come out with an average of them both, okay? Question? In the case of something like that, that's a small structure, do you run a scout and then set it, I'm assuming? Yeah, that's a good question. If we're setting an ROI on the aorta, we'll do our scout images, and then we'll do an actual axial image and set the ROI on an axial image that was acquired at a single level. Does that make sense? So if I was setting this for an abdominal, for a AAA study, I would do my scout, oh my goodness, image of this person, where I would get an AP and lateral scout image of this person. I would determine the level, and then that level would generate an axial image. I would set my, ax my ROI on that axial image. Good question. Okay. 
Hounsfield measurements and standard deviations. A Hounsfield measurement can be affected by the volume averaging of the uh, Im and image noise. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how street get artifacts affect the quality of the image. They can also affect the way that we're making our measurements. All right. So generally, when we have a Hounsfield unit that's given to us by an ROI. Um, it's going to pr provide an average measurement of all the pixels within the ROI. It'll give you the Hounsfield measurement. It will also give you a standard deviation. So again, plus or minus some amount, right? It's accounting for the noise that may be in that sample, right? So we want um, standard deviation to be pretty small. When we make these samples, we want to keep that number low. That's another way of making sure that I place my ROI in the correct place. Again, if I set it between the aorta and um, the peritoneal cavity or whatever, it would give me a Hounsfield unit average, but it would also give me a very large standard deviation. It would indicate that something about the sample is weird. Now, there's a lot of other things that we can do with CT data and CT images, so it's worth thinking about these things. We can do distance measurements, um, so we can measure the size of a tumor or the volume of an organ. Um, we can annotate the images, so we can, once we've made a measurement, we can indicate what the measurement meant to us. Um, we can create reference images, and she has a picture of what a reference image looks like in the textbook. They're largely... Um, done in either an AP or lateral display and it would actually show you what level the various um, CT image slices were set at throughout the course of the scan. So we'll use reference images a lot when we get into sectional anatomy. There'll be ways of knowing where the, where the image was taken and as it, ha as it relates to other areas of anatomy. This is really critical with a lot of different things, but one, one area it directly translates to is, for example, a CT of the lumbar spine, which is what she's displayed here on page 38. She has a lateral view from the scout of a CT of the lumbar spine with reference levels for all the different slices that were acquired. And so by looking at this image, I can know what vertebra is currently in view in the axial image. I can count up from L5 and know, okay, I'm at L2 or L1 or T12 or wherever. So those reference images are a powerful tool. We can also magnify the images. We can create images that have multiple images displayed in a single image. We can mess with the histograms. Um, and she has an example of that on page 412. Mm. I'm sorry, page 39, but it's figure 412. The histogram is the way that the computer thinks about the information that's displayed and generally there's a peak to it and then some kind of trough. So I can tell it what area I want um, by, by altering a histogram I can change where essentially I can change the window width and level for the data set. Um, uh, and you can also make evaluations of when like a contrast bolus occurred or whatever from a histogram. So when I do bolus tracking, sometimes on some systems, you actually are given a histogram for the area. You set a determination for when the bolus tracking system should trigger the scanner to go. When the ROI hits that level, on the, you're fine. When you, when you, when the bolus tracking system hits that level, on the histogram, it will trigger the scanner. Okay, um, and then multiplanar and 3D reformatting—that's a whole another lecture. But we can do some really interesting stuff in terms of creating 3D images.